Hello everyone, welcome back once again to Mathematics for Liberal Arts Chapter 15. In this exciting edition, we are going to dramatically stay in Section 15.2, although this will be the last time. Since we have covered the mean, we've covered percentiles, we only have medians really to talk about. Well, medians and one other topic called the five number summary, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. The important thing to know for today is that you can't understand what the median is unless you remember your percentiles. So, with that in mind, I'm going to very briefly remind you how we find percentiles. So, we're going to start with the data set D. D is going to be organized, as per usual, from least to greatest data point. We're also going to need a value, a whole number, P, between 0 and 100. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the pth percentile, VP, for D by following the steps below. Step 1, we need the locator number, LP. LP is found by taking P, dividing it by 100, and then multiplying the result by N. If we do that, there are two possibilities. LP might be a whole number. If LP is a whole number, then what we need to do is we need to find the LPth and the LP plus one data point of D. How do we do that? Well, we go back up to D. Since it's organized from least to greatest, we just start counting X1, X2, X3, and we keep on doing that until eventually we wind up at X LP and then the next data point after that XLP plus 1 they're going to be somewhere in the middle although we don't know exactly where we take the LP and the LP plus 1 data points we add them together and divide by 2 and that will be for us the pth percentile there is one other possibility with LP LP might be not a whole number if LP is not a whole number, first of all, we need to round it up to a whole number, and we'll call that whole number L. And we're going to call the pth percentile, in this case, the Lth data point of D, XL. And just like in the previous case, we find the Lth data point by starting at X1, then going to X2, then X3, and just keeping on counting until eventually we find XL, which will once again be somewhere in the middle of D. I'm not going to redo this example on this page, but I am going to draw your attention to the fact that we calculated the 50th percentile, V50. V50 is exactly what the median is. So let's go ahead and say that in a formal definition. If we are given a data set D organized from least to greatest data point, then we define the median for D to be M sometimes also written as MD, if you want to make sure everybody knows the median comes from D, and it will be the 50th percentile V50 for D. Already we've had a good example of finding the 50th percentile, so I recommend that you go back to this example in the previous video and review it if you're interested. Let me also go ahead and point out one important thing here. If we come back to the calculation for step one, finding the locator value, what you'll notice is that if we're looking for the 50th percentile, in other words, if we're looking for L50, according to our formula, we should be doing 50 divided by 100 times N. And some really brief calculations should show that 50 over 100 is nothing more than one half. So, in the examples that I'm going to do in just a minute, one of the ways to quickly be able to work your way through the examples is to start by remembering that to find the locator number for our data set, for the percentile, all you have to do is divide n, the number of data points, by 2. That will then allow you to move directly to step 2, if the result is a whole number, or step 3, if the result is not a whole number it makes your life much, much simpler. 
Let me also point something else out to you. From the definition of the median and from our definition of percentiles, it follows at once that when you find the median for a data set D, the median is the exact middle of the data set. In other words, 50% of the data points for D are going to be less than or equal to the median, and 50% of the data points are going to be greater than or equal to the median. Now, you may remember that back in 15.2 part one, I mentioned that the mean of a data set D is almost the middle of the data. And I stand by that statement. But now that we've said that the median is the middle of the data, and we've said that the mean is almost the middle, it might be interesting to wonder what is the comparison between the two? Are the two the same? Well, not usually. Sometimes the mean and the median are the same, but most of the time they're simply numbers which are relatively close to one another, which is interesting in and of itself. However, they are not the same, and the easiest way to see that they are not the same is to point out a very simple fact. The mean for a data set D is sensitive to outlier data, meaning data which is either very, very large, exceptionally large for the data set, or very, very small, exceptionally small for the data set. And on the other hand, the median for D is not nearly as sensitive. Let's take a look at an example of this happening. So we have two data sets, D and E. We're going to find the mean and the median for them both, and we're going to compare them. And the reason for this is, if we look at the data set E, we'll notice that the middle points, one, two, and three, are all identical to the points of D. The only difference between D and E are these exceptionally large and exceptionally small values, which makes 0 and 99 outliers. We're going to show that the mean for D and the mean for E are different, but, and this is a major massive hint, we're going to actually show that the medians are the same. So let's see. If I want to find the mean for D, I add all the data points values together and divide by the number of data points, which gives me six over three, or in other words, two. If I do the same thing for E, I add all the data points together, which this time around is a slightly longer list, and I divide by the number of data points, which in this case appears to be five. That gives me 105, not 106, 105 over 5. And since 105 is divisible by 5, it appears the result is 21. Okay. Now I'm not going to do the full calculations for the medians. I'm going to simply let you Look at these sets, do the calculations yourselves, and verify what I'm about to say. But I notice that the middle for both of these data sets is exactly 2. Here in D, there are three data points. The middle of the data set is 2. Here in E, the middle of the data set appears to be 2 again because we have five data points. So I'm going to claim, and once again, this is for you to check yourself using the full calculations, that the median is two for both data sets. So think of this example in the following way. We started out with a set D, we moved from D to a set E, which introduced a couple of outliers. Doing this caused the mean to change from D to E, but it did not cause the median to change. What this means, what this actually shows, is that as long as the extremes, the outliers of a data set are balanced out, if we have a low and a high, then you're definitely not going to change the median. 
You may have other instances under which the median doesn't change. However, this is a pretty good example showing that the means may differ and the medians might be the same. This is both a good and a bad thing. On the one hand, it's still telling us good information. It's still telling us that 50% of the data for D or for E falls to the left of 2 and falls to the right of 2 as well. And that information is just as useful as it was before. However, it's also not useful from the standpoint of if I were to look at the median and the median only for the data sets D and E, I wouldn't really know that they were different data sets. That may sound like a funny statement considering we're staring at D and E, but think of it this way. If I simply said to you, I have two sets D and E, they both have median two, you would have no way of knowing that D and E were different sets. From your perspective, they may be different or they might be the same. You'd have no way of knowing. In this case, the mean would actually be a slightly better description because at least with the mean, we would know that they were different data sets. There is a way to overcome this, and the way to overcome this is, unfortunately, to add in more data. So we're going to need some more definitions. So given a data set D ordered from least to greatest, the first quartile, Q1, and the third quartile, Q3, for D are the 25th and the 75th percentiles. So this is very much like we did with the median. We simply look for the 25th and the 75th, uh, 75th percentile, excuse me. The 25th percentile is called the first quartile, and the 75th is called the third quartile. And actually, speaking of the median, whenever we talk about quartiles, we frequently think of a second quartile, Q2, and Q2 is going to be exactly the same thing as the median. In other words, when we have a data set D, Q2 and M are exactly the same. What we're going to do with these quartiles and the median is the following. We're going to give the five number summary for D. And the five number summary consists of, first of all, the smallest number, the smallest data point of D, which if we've ordered from least to greatest is X1. The first quartile, the median or second quartile, the third quartile, and then the maximum data point of D, which if we've ordered once again, should be XN. If we put these five numbers together, the five number summary, then we have a slightly better idea of what the behavior is for D. And that allows us to overcome problems like the median not changing between two data sets which just happen to have different extremes. So let's go ahead and show what this looks like. We're going to calculate these values first, and then after that, we're going to actually show them visually. Okay, so first of all, D is not ordered from least to greatest. So for us, this will not do we're gonna go ahead and write out what D should look like if we order it. So it appears that D should be three, five, six, seven, nine. Okay, very good. And we can already answer some of this information. So X1 is three, and this definitely, because of the work we've done, is the minimum for D. And let's see, x, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So x5, which is nine, is definitely the maximum for d. And since I have those two values, let's go ahead and label them in our picture. We will call the minimum, well, actually, we'll label the minimum, let's say, in blue right here with a vertical line. And in a red vertical line, we'll label the maximum right here. Okay, so much for the easy stuff. Let's go ahead and move on 
to the next part. So now we need Q1. Now in order to find Q1, we're going to need to calculate the percentile, the 25th percentile for D. I'm going to do this one out all the way so that you can see the result. And then after that, I'm going to let you guys do the rest of them. So we need the locator for 25, which means 25 divided by 100 and then times, I think we said there were one, two, three, four, five, five data points. And if we do that, we should wind up with, well, let's see, four divide, uh, five divided by four, 1.25. Okay. What that means, since we have not gotten a whole number, is we should round this up to two. I guess I'll go ahead and put that right here. So we're gonna round it up to two. Now that we have L equals two, we're going to say that the first quartile is the 25th percentile, is, according to our locator, the second data point of D, which appears to be five. All right. Since we have now done all the work and we see that the first quartile is equal to five, I'm going to get rid of some of these calculations since they take up so much room. And once I've taken up all of these calculations, I'm simply going to write in the result of the calculations. Q1 is equal to V25 is equal to five. Okay, let's fill in the rest of these values for the quartiles. All right, there they are. So, now that we have those values, let's go ahead and label them as well. This time I'm going to use green for all of them. So let's see, we said that Q1 is five, which is right here, vertical line there, Q2, is six, another vertical line there. And Q3 is seven, so another vertical line there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these results and I'm going to turn them into a little box. I'm going to label Q1, oops, I got ahead of myself and started to write Q3. I'm gonna label Q1 here Rather than write Q2, even though it would be okay, I'm going to put M there, and I'm going to label Q3 here. So now we know that five, the one edge of the box, is Q1, six is the median, and the other edge of the box, seven, is Q3. And then I'm going to simply connect, oops, maybe uh, connect just a little bit too much. I'm going to connect the two extreme values to my little box with two lines. This is what we call a box and whisker plot. The whole point of the box and whisker plot is to show you the five number sum summary visually. We could simply look at these five numbers. We could say Q1 is five, Q2 is six, Q3 is seven, and then the minimum and maximum are three and nine. But if we have a, a, a chance to do a visual representation of the data, we could just as easily draw it like so. Vertical lines at the minimum and the maximum, then vertical lines at the first quartile, the median or second quartile, and the third quartile. We make a box out of the first, median, and second quartiles, and then we connect with whiskers to the minimum and maximum, a box and whisker plot. And this would be considerably better. If we are given a box and whisker plot, we can tell the difference between a couple of data sets uh, without being 
too descriptive of another data set, let's just draw an imaginary box and whisker plot and compare the two. So let's say I have a box and whisker plot that looks like so. Now I have two box and whisker plots, one over top of the other. And we'll say that this comes from the data set E and in green to make sure we can tell the difference, this one comes from the data set D. Well, if all I was given, apart from the names of the data sets, were the box and whisker plots for the two of them, we can immediately tell the difference because now we can look at them and say, okay, well, the smallest a data point for E is larger than the smallest data point for D. It looks like the smallest data point of E is a six, whereas the smallest data point of D is a three. The medians and first quartile, the medians are different as are the first and second, uh, excuse me, first and third quartiles. It looks like Q1 for D is five, whereas Q1 for E is maybe 7.5 and Q3 for D is seven, while Q3 for E is nine, and the maximum for E is larger than the maximum for D, which makes this a convenient way to tell the difference between the two of them. There is only one downside. That downside is that, unfortunately, we had to calculate five numbers before we could get this summary of the data for D and even though we did not explicitly calculate the five numbers for E, somebody had to calculate the five number summary for E before we could draw this box and whisker plot. It is a good way to tell the difference between the two of them, but if our goal was to try to represent the data sets D and E using as little uh, information as possible, a five number summary is a little bit over the top. In the next section, we're going to talk about how to represent D and E, or different sets, let's call them D and E as well, but arbitrary sets without worrying about calculating five numbers. Instead, we're going to try and see if we can bottleneck it down to two. But that'll be enough for this video and enough for section 15.2. Thank you everybody so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video.